Good morning, everyone. This is Joanne Bassetta from the Green Communities Division. Welcome to our December webinar. Um, with us, we have Caitlin Kelly, who will be giving us the latest and greatest information on the SMART program. But first, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the Green Communities Program. Um, our, the Green Communities Division is a one-stop shop for anything energy-related for cities and towns. We provide uh, technical assistance, grants, um, resources such as this webinar on anything that's energy related and um, we can also connect you to uh, folks within DOER and with our partner organizations such as the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Um, for many of you probably are uh, aware of our Green Communities Grant and Designation Program. That's our hallmark program, but again, we have other resources uh, such as the Mass Energy Insight Energy Tracking Tool, the Technical Assistance Grants for Municipalities, and those are available to any city or town or regional school district. You do not need to be a green community for the Municipal Energy Technical Assistance. Uh, the website I mentioned, and um, there's a, you can see the link to the website there. And um, if you are not on our email list, you can sign up and you can get e-blasts that include information on grant opportunities, webinars such as this, and other items of interest for cities and towns. Oh, trying to advance the slide. Hang on one second. Okay, I skipped over. Previous. Sorry about that. All right, uh, a bit about um, the webinar. It will be recorded and posted on the website in about 48 hours. It will include the audio as well as the slides themselves. If you find a slide that has information Hi, hi everyone. Sorry about that. I think we had some sort of technical glitch. Um, so um, I don't know if you heard any of the information I just mentioned, and if I did, I apologize for repeating myself, and if I didn't, um, welcome. Uh, this is Joey Ampicetta from the Green Communities Division, and welcome to our December webinar, where we have Caitlin Kelly, who will be giving us the latest and greatest information about the Massachusetts SMART program. Um, those of you who are not familiar with the Green Communities Division at the Department of Energy Resources, we are a one-stop shop for anything energy-related for cities and towns. Um, you don't have to be a green community to um, contact us, and we can provide assistance with uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, technical assistance, um, other resources that are available within DOER, as well as our partner organizations. Um, so, uh, one of the main things that we do is the Green Communities Designation and Grant Program. We also provide a free online tracking tool for um, energy use within municipal and school buildings. We also provide municipal energy technical assistance grants, and again, those are available to any city or town or regional school district. And we have um, assistance for energy management services procurement, and a website that has all sorts of resources that uh, cities and towns would find of interest. And you can see the web link there. 
And also we have an e-blast list. We probably uh, send maybe two a month, so we're not going to flood your inboxes. If you're not signed up, uh, it might be a good idea to sign up if you want information about um, any upcoming grants, webinars, trainings, or anything that might be of interest uh, for cities and towns. There we go. Oh, let me go back. Um, one of the best parts about the Green Communities Division is our wonderful staff out in the regions. We have Jim Barry in the Western Mass region, Neil Duffy in the Eastern Mass, uh, Kelly Brown in Central Region, and Seth Pickering in the Southeastern part of the state. They are uh, embedded, as you will, at the DEP offices uh, in those locations, and they're folks on the ground that can really uh, work with your city or town, uh, come to meetings, uh, phone calls, et cetera. So if you have not yet reached out to them, uh, please make note of their um, contact information. And um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the DOER website in about 48 hours. It would include the slides as well as the audio um, recording. If you find a slide that you find particularly interesting and you want to save it right away, there's a handy camera icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And if you click on that, you'll take a screenshot of the slide. And also, uh, please note that we will have a Q&A afterwards, and um, there should be a spot on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type questions as we go along. Um, if we end up running out of time and don't get to all the questions, the questions and answers will be posted with the webinar files. And there's uh, my contact information and again the um, email address to sign up for the eblasts. And with that, I'm going to pass the keyboard and the mouse over to Caitlin Kelly. Thank you, Joanne. Um, and thank you for having me come talk to everyone today. Uh, just as a heads up, as Joanne mentioned, this is going to be recorded and the slides will be available. These are also uh, slides that we've taken from our larger presentation that is currently on the DOER Smart webpage. Uh, so they are pretty text heavy, so don't, you know, if you miss something, if you have questions, you can go back uh, and you can also follow up with me uh, at a later time if you have any more specific questions. But we just wanted to give you a basic overview of the program again and where we stand now. Uh, the SMART program, the Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target Program, is a 1,600 megawatt AC declining block tariff program. Uh, the program is designed to provide fixed base compensation rates to, comp to qualified generators. And as products are qualified throughout the blocks and blocks progress, those compensation rates will decline. It applies to all investor-owned electric distribution companies, so that includes Eversource, National Grid, and Unitel Service Territories. It is not available to municipal light districts. And the way the program is designed is there are two different terms depending on the size of the system that is being qualified. For systems 25 kW or less, uh, it's a 10-year tariff term that they will be receiving incentive payments. For systems over 25 kW, up to five megawatts AC, uh, it's a 20-year incentive term. They, they will be receiving incentive payments. We differentiate the way the compensation is structured, uh, depending on whether the system is installed behind the meter or if it's serving on-site load before it's going out to the grid first, or if it's a standalone where it's essentially connected directly to the grid. We also have four types of compensation rate adders that are available to eligible facilities. We have location-based adders off-taker-based adders, energy storage adder, and a solar tracking adder. And each of these categories and the specific adders within them are meant to encourage particular types of program uh, project designs and also uh, to encourage uh, projects that benefit particular communities. And we do that through the additional incentive that the adder provides. And as I mentioned, you can get up to five megawatts uh, 
for the incentive, uh, project size 5 megawatts AC, but we also only allow 5 megawatts per parcel. We established the initial base compensation rates, so the block one rates, uh, as a result of a competitive procurement that we ran last year. Uh, we announced those rates on January 11th of this year. The base compensation rates between blocks are differentiated based on the utilities service territory. So with using the results of the competitive procurement that we ran, we tried to differentiate uh, incentive rates that were appropriate for different service territories because there are differentials in costs for developing projects in different parts of the state. Eligible projects can receive compensation for energy through one of three mechanisms. Uh, so you can be a net meter facility through a net meter tariff, so that's if you are able to qualify for net metering and you're able to obtain a net metering cap allocation. There's the qualifying facility tariff, uh, which each utility has, which is essentially you are getting what's an equivalent to a wholesale rate for the energy that you generate. And we created a new uh, mechanism under the SMART program called the Alternative on Bill Crediting Mechanism. So this is available for standalone facilities uh, and it was designed to be an alternative to virtual net metering. We designed the program to try to steer projects toward optimal locations. Um, and this is not only by providing the location-based adders, uh, which I'll get into in a little bit, but also greenfield subtractors. Basically, any project that's over 500 kW that's located on, a, on open space uh, or has to have deforestation to build the project uh, will be subject to a greenfield subtractor unless it meets the eligibility criteria to not receive a subtractor. So the subtractor is applied to the base rate um, and it's basically reducing the amount of the incentive it receives through the tariff. We're also trying to encourage energy storage. So we designed the adder for uh, systems that are paired with batteries through a variable adder. So basically the adder that you receive is based on a formula that looks at both the size of the battery as a percentage of the size of the PV system, and then also the duration of the battery. And we do have some performance standards and operational requirements for uh, projects that qualify for the energy storage adder and are putting a battery onto the PV system that they're qualifying. So now we have our first poll question, um, just to see which service territory uh, our attendees are, are located in today. They should be able to vote. Yeah, so you should be able to select um, which service territory you're located in at this time. About 54% are in National Grid Nantucket, 28% are in Eversource East, 3% uh, Unitil, 7% Eversource West, and 7% Municipal Light. Okay. So there are a number of factors that impact the actual incentive rate that you can receive under the SMART program. Uh, one of the main factors is the electric distribution company service territory. Uh, so it sounds like we have a decent spread among our attendees here. Uh, I'll, I have a, an, a real time update of project applications later on in, in the process, but basically now you're looking at a, a higher rate that's still available in Eversource East. Um, we are filled uh, with projects in Eversource West, 
So we will have a wait list. We'll have a wait list in Unitil. Now, we're still at the highest rate for Nantucket, but for National Grid, uh, we are getting towards the end, uh, towards the lower end of the spectrum, and we're on block seven of eight. So like I said, we'll get into the details of that later. And the reason that that matters, which Eversource territory you're in and which capacity block you're in, because we have those declining block rates between the capacity blocks. So they decline by 4% for the service territories that have eight capacity blocks. Uh, for service territories that have a lower amount of load, uh, specifically in Unitil and in Nantucket, they don't have eight blocks. Unitil has four blocks and Nantucket has two. So the rate by which they decline between blocks is higher than 4% to, uh, to match the rate of decline in the rest of the state. The AC rated capacity of the project that you qualify for uh, also has an impact on the base compensation rate and the total rate you receive. Uh, we have a varied structure for incentive rates, so in each block, uh, the blocks decline in general, but the lowest incentive amount goes to the largest projects because they are cheaper to build. So projects one over one megawatt and um, projects that are over a megawatt up to five megawatts are getting the lowest rate. And then projects that are getting the highest rate are 25 kW or less. And then it's a, a tiered rate between those sizes. Another thing that could impact your total compensation rate is whether or not the project is eligible for a compensation rate adder. So you have your base compensation rate and then you can add an incentive if you are building a particular type of project that is eligible for an adder. And then in the same vein, you may get a lower compensation rate if you have a greenfield subtractor that applies. So if you're building an open space, you may be subject to a greenfield subtractor and get a slight reduction. And then finally, you're looking at whether your, your facility is installed behind the meter or is a standalone facility. Um, so basically, if you're building behind the meter versus standalone, we're going to add up what your total value is in the same way between the two different types of projects. But then how we calculate your incentive changes. Um, so we have a way of calculating a fixed incentive payment for behind the meter systems and for the incentive payment for standalone systems may vary month to month and we'll get into that details of that in a little bit. As I mentioned we have compensation rate adders. We have the four categories I mentioned earlier. Systems that are larger than 25 kW may qualify for one adder from each category. Um, and for systems less than or equal to 25 kW, they may only qualify for the energy storage adder. And we have a number of guidelines that I recommend um, reviewing if you're interested in, your, in pursuing one of these adders. Um, so we have our definition of agricultural solar tariff generation units guideline, which outlines the process by which systems that might be interested in building on active farmland but building a dual-use system um, should review because that's actually if you are interested in, in the ag adder you should definitely read this guideline because it is a, a, a fairly detailed process for getting qualified as this type of project. We also have an adder on brownfield, a guideline on the brownfields adder, uh, a guideline and a calculator for the energy storage adder. We have a guideline on low income generation units so we have a number of, of incentives and adders uh, to try to reach the low-income population and low-income ratepayers. So uh, if you are interested in looking at one of those adders or types of systems, I recommend you review that guideline as well. And then we have a guideline simply on the statement of qualification and capacity block reservation process. So how do you apply, what's our process, uh, how do we qualify projects under this program? And we have all these guidelines published on our website um, on the page that's linked here. So these are all of the adders that are eligible under the SMART program. So as you can see, we have the four categories and there are six types of location-based adders, 
four types of off-taker based adders, and then we have separately the energy storage adder and the solar tracking adder. So a project can build a brownfield that's also community shared solar with energy storage. Uh, I don't know if you would do dual use, dual access tracking on that type of project, but uh, if you do, uh, you can do, you know, a building mounted, low income, uh, battery storage with dual access tracking. So you can get one from each category. You, however, cannot double up within one category. So you can't do a building mounted brownfield system, um, or you can't do a public entity system that's also a low income property owner, for instance. So you can't double up uh, within a category. And all these adder values right here represent the values for the first tranche of tracking these adders. So as I mentioned, the base compensation rates for SMART decline by capacity block, and those are measured by utility service territory. For the adders, we established tranches. So we're actually tracking how many projects statewide are qualifying for these adders. And the first tranche is 80 megawatts for each adder. So as of this point in time, we actually have received more than 80 megawatts for both the community shared solar adder and for the battery storage adder. We have not yet received 80 megawatts for the rest of those adders. So we are going to be announcing the tranche sizes uh, as very, fairly soon. We're hoping to get the announcement out in the next few weeks. Um, but obviously, the tranche sizes, since each tranche declines by 4%, will impact the value that an adder may be at when you're applying to qualify for that particular type of project. And again, more information on these adder values and future tranche sizes can be found in another guideline. We have a guideline that lists the values for every capacity block and also uh, the values for uh, different adder tranches. Uh, on our website. As I mentioned before, uh, capacity blocks are assigned on a rolling basis, uh, and they do decline by 4% between blocks. If one project covers two capacity blocks, that project will have uh, a unique prorated rate. So if we have a three megawatt project that comes in and it we're finishing up tr block three in a particular service territory, but there's only one megawatt left, then the value that's assigned to that project for its base compensation rate will be calculated at one megawatt at the block three value and then two megawatts at the block four value. And as capacity becomes available, so if we are on block eight or if we have a wait list, for instance, if we have projects that uh, fall out, so they become qualified, but then they lose their statement of qualification, the available capacity will be added to the current open block or to the last block available. For adder tranches, again, they are assigned on a rolling basis. Um, we have 80 megawatt tranche sizes for uh, the tranche one for all adders based on the PV size of the project. So that's particularly important for projects that are applying for battery storage. We're looking at the size of the PV, not the size of the battery um, and how we are filling up the tranche. And again, if we have a project that covers two adder tranches, it, as opposed to how we're calculating that unique rate for the base capacity rate, uh, for the adder, it's just going to be which, which adder tranche does it fall into. So the majority of the capacity of the project, does it fall into the higher adder or to the lower adder? And whichever adder uh, it has the most capacity in, that will be the value that that project is eligible for for that particular adder. Land use categories. 
So land use categories are important because this is how we determine whether or not a project is subject to a greenfield subtractor. Category one receives no greenfield subtractor. Category two uh, receives a kind of a half greenfield subtractor and category three receives the full greenfield subtractor. And the way that we're calculating it is we're looking at the, the acre of the area impacted. So how do we measure that? we're literally just going to be calculating the square footage of the PV panels of the system. And what the category that a project falls into is determined based on a number of factors, uh, so including but not necessarily limited to, is the system located on land and agricultural use? Uh, what is the size of the system? Is it ground mounted? Uh, what's the existing condition of the land? What is the zoning of the land? So all of these questions may determine whether or not a project falls into uh, one, two, category one, two, or three. So these are all things you want to look at. And we do have another guideline on land use and siting on our website. Uh, I recommend you review it. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to follow up. So category one, land use. Uh, so category one, we actually have two different types of category one. We have category one agricultural and category one non-agricultural. So if you're building a project and the land that the project is located on is determined to be land and agricultural use, it can only qualify as category one if it qualifies for the dual use ag adder, if it's located on a building, or if it's sized to meet no more than 200% of the annual operation load of a farming operation. So how do we define land and agricultural use? We use two different criteria. One, has the land been in 61A in the past five years, or is it currently in 61A? Or uh, is the land located on prime soils as defined, defined by the US uh, DANR? So we have maps located on uh, Oliver Mass GIS, which has the prime soils mapped into it. So if you're looking at a site that either wasn't in 61A or isn't currently in 61A, but you have questions about whether or not it's on prime soils, you can use the maps available through Mass GIS to review that. And if you have a project that's located on land that's not determined to be agricultural or prime agricultural farmland, then you can also qualify in category one if it's 500 kW or less, if it's a building mounted system, if it's sited on a brownfield or a landfill, if it's located on land that's been previously developed as defined by DOER. So for, the, for that, basically, like has there been development already on the site um, that you are actually going to build the project? Um, so we're not looking at development on the parcel per se, we're looking at the site. And then we're also looking at whether or not the project complies with local zoning that explicitly addresses solar. So if the town has established a solar overlay district, if the town has uh, a as a right solar bylaw, if the town has established that solar can be built with the granting of a special permit and the special permit is obtained, and if that any of those cases happen, you would be in category one and not subject to a greenfield subtractor. Category two are projects that are located on land that has not been previously developed, but it's zoned for commercial and industrial development. So basically, if it is technically open space or if it's forested land, but the, the local zoning is for CNI, then you have a half greenfield subtractor. And category three is basically everything else. So category three, we're looking at large ground mounted systems. And uh, if there's no local zoning, if it's not previously developed, uh, you know, any of that criteria is met, then the system is subject to the full green field subtractor. Okay. So we have our second poll question now uh, for the attendees. Do you currently have a project in the smart queue? So have you submitted a project at some point uh, in the past week and a half since we opened on November 26th? Collecting the data. 
and it looks like uh, nine. Oh, just change a little bit. Okay, so it's seventy per six. 76% of the vote in, it is 12% yes, 88% no. Okay. So for those that have a smart application in or may soon have a smart application in, I'm just going to go over how the incentive payments are calculated and how they're made. So. Once a smart application is submitted and approved and the system is operational, uh, DOER will set an incentive payment effective date. So that date will be set in the final statement of qualification that is issued. Uh, it will be the first day that production is eligible to receive incentive payments and generate class one recs. So the class one recs will go to the utility that's paying the incentive, um, but any production from that day forward will be credited and calculated for an incentive payment to the generation unit owner. It's generally going to be the same day uh, as a project's commercial operation date, so the date that the utility grants the authorization to interconnect, um, but we may set it at a date sometime in the future as well. Uh, for those of you who may be familiar with how we qualify projects under the RPS, very similar to how we set the RPS effective date or the SREC effective date, the same concept. So essentially your tariff term will begin on the incentive payment effective date and will last for 10 or 20 years depending on the size of the project. The actual incentive payment, so once you're approved, enrolled in the tariff, it will begin to be paid within three billing cycles of the claim approval. So once you get full and final approval and the project is registered with the utility companies, they will issue an incentive payment within three billing cycles. They will be made on a monthly basis, either through check or electronic funds transfer. So when a, an applicant is finalizing the application and is ready to be enrolled in the tariff, the applicant should choose how they want to be paid um, that incentive payment. The incentive payments themselves will have a 90-day lifespan. So uh, this is particularly important if the in recipient of the incentive payment changes or if bank account information changes. Uh, those updates should be provided expeditiously to the utility company to avoid a loss of the incentive payment. And then for behind the meter systems, just another thing to keep in mind, if you have a behind the meter system, you have to make sure that the EDC meter is installed uh, before a claim can be approved because that will be the meter that they need to read before they can issue incentive payments. And again, as I mentioned before, we do differentiate uh, how incentive payments are calculated based on whether a system is standalone or behind the meter. So standalone facilities are facilities with no associated load other than parasitic or station load. So these are your, kind of your classic standalone projects. Uh, standalone projects could also be on a building, but if they just interconnected in a way that it's going directly to the grid as opposed to behind that building's meter, that would still technically be considered a standalone facility. And how we calculate the incentive is once we figure out your all-in smart rate, and we know how you're getting paid for your energy. So whether you're receiving net metering credits, alternative on-bill credits, or if you're getting QF payments, um, the incentive payment will be your total rate, net whatever you're getting on the energy side. So the value of energy is how you're, whatever you're receiving uh, as a credit that month um, or as a payment that month through the QF, and then the difference is made up as the incentive payment to bring you up to your total rate. For behind the meter facilities, basically if you are serving on-site load before going to the grid, the incentive payment value is fixed for the duration of the tariff term. So we do a calculation uh, when the project is submitted to us at the initial its initial application. And we're looking at the value of energy 
uh, for any energy that's served behind the meter. So we're taking whatever smart rate you qualify for minus the value of energy. And that difference is now fixed for the duration of the term. So for standalone facilities, the total compensation is intended to account for both energy and incentive. So the smart rate that you qualify for will cover both of those things. The, as I mentioned before, uh, if it's a standalone facility and it's a net meter generation unit, then the net metering credit will be, you will receive that net metering credit on your bill every month, but then the value of that net metering credit will be subtracted out from whatever rate you qualify for, and that's the actual incentive payment you receive. If you are an AOBC system, so alternative on bill credit generation unit, then the value of that credit uh, will be subtracted out from your SMART rate every month. Uh, you get the credit on your bill, and then you can allocate it to other people as you would for virtual net metering credits, and the difference is paid as an incentive payment. Non-net meter generation units are getting paid directly by the utility for their energy. So uh, with these QF systems, in many cases, they may actually just receive one check that is the value of the, the SMART incentive rate because QS are generally paid in cash anyways, uh, as opposed to the bill credits for QS, your energy is just a cash payment as well. So energy plus incentive will always equal whatever rate you qualify for under SMART. For behind the meter systems, it's, a, it's more complicated just in the beginning, but the actual incentive payment itself is actually simpler than standalone because it's just the fixed incentive rate that is calculated at the time that you qualify at the beginning times the total KWH that that system generates each month. So there's a lot of text, but essentially what we're taking is the value of energy to approximate the avoided cost of electricity for a system that is serving on-site load. So if you're serving on-site load directly, you're offsetting having to purchase that same KWH at a retail rate. So the way that the, we are valuing that energy is a three-year average of basic service plus current volumetric rates for distribution, transmission, and transition. So we take the combination of those four values, subtract it out from whatever your smart qualified rate is, and the difference is now fixed. So that is what you will be paid as an incentive every month, that amount times KWH. And on our website, we actually have posted the 2018 um, value of energy rates for behind the meter systems based on the utility rate class uh, in each service territory. So you can figure out what you'd probably be receiving as an incentive payment um, for a system that is qualified from now to the end of 2018. Um, and we are working on getting the 2019 values from the utilities, so we should have that posted uh, in the next two weeks as well. What is the AOBC? I've mentioned this before. Uh, it's the alternative on bill credit. It was approved by the DPU. So it's very similar to net metering. It's just only for smart qualified systems. So it's only in the smart system for standalone projects. Um, the value of the AOBC is set at the basic service rate of the generator. So that's another thing to keep in mind is if you are, for instance, in national grid service territory and there is no net metering cap space available, so you're building a project that will be qualified as AOBC. The value of those bill credits will be the basic service rate applied to the rate class that the generator is classified as. It's not the basic service rate of the rate class of the customer that may be receiving the bill credits. So if that's allocated to that customer, the value will generally be related to that, usually like a G1 rate of a generator. There's no limit on the number of credits that can be transferred to customers, however. So that is one thing that the DPU did determine, that there's no limit. Um, so you can allocate as many AOBCs as you want to a customer. However, 
um, they can be uh, cashed out by the utility once a year. Credits uh, must be allocated to a customer bill within three billing periods. So this is something that has been raised to the DPU um, by customers who are utilizing virtual net metering about misallocation of credits, about delay of the allocation of credits. So the DPU did say that the utilities have to start tracking these instances where credits are delayed or there are misallocations. So they are making sure that the utilities are paying attention to that. And then we have a separate form for AOBC systems. So for those of you who may be familiar with how net metering works and filling out the Schedule Z form, we have a very similar form to Schedule Z called just the Payment Credit Transfer Form. And that's where you list all of your the off takers that the AOBCs generated by the generation unit can be sent to. So that form can be updated twice a year. Um, so this process is also expected to be automated uh, in the coming years. The, the EDCs have said that they are planning on taking steps toward the automation of this process. So hopefully once that happens, uh, that form can be updated more often than twice a year. So I know that we only have some of you who have submitted uh, smart products, and many of you have not. So our Next poll question is whether or not the, the projects that are forthcoming into the smart queue, have you been issued your interconnection service agreement by the utility company yet? Okay. All right. So the reason I wanted to ask this question is because having the ISA is one of the major requirements for getting into the smart queue. So I'll go over the application process now. So the application process for the smart program is actually a two-step process. So you apply initially for what we're calling your preliminary statement of qualification. And that gets you your reservation period in the program, uh, and you have to build the project, and then you're interconnected, you submit your claim, and then you're enrolled in the tariff. But before you can start that process, you have to have certain documentation, so especially for projects over 25 kW. For large projects over 25 kW, you have to have a fully executed interconnection service agreement. Um, you have to have site control or the developer that you have selected uh, to build the project must have site control of the site. And they also have to have been issued all necessary non-ministerial permits. For small systems, we just require the installation contract with the customer. So once that documentation is obtained, you can submit your application through the PowerFlirt portal, uh, which is maintained by our Solar Program Administrator Clear Result to submit the application. You're issued your preliminary SQ. At that point, you install an interconnect the system, submit the claim, again, through the same portal, the same application portal, showing us that you have received your authorization to interconnect. You're issued the final SQ, and then you're enrolled in the tariff and can begin receiving incentive payments. So again, just going over the requirements required to submit your initial application for SMART. For 25 kW or less, uh, we'd need that contract with the installer. We also have a number of customer disclosure forms. So we do require that the installer go over certain points of their contract with the customer and kind of outline them on a form that we've created. And we want to make sure that that is complete and submitted. And for small systems, we have a the highest base compensation rate for small systems on a low-income utility rate. So we just need to see proof of that if that is applicable. For over 25 kW, as I mentioned, we need the fully executed ISA, so signed by both the interconnecting party and by the utility company. Um, site control demonstrating to us that the developer, the installer, uh, has access to the site, uh, essentially, so they 
you know, they can go and they can start building. Um, Non-ministerial permits. So these are permits that are uh, basically issued with a vote, essentially. So if there was a required zoning change, and we need to see that the zoning board approved it. Um, the most common ones for ground mount are the order of conditions as issued by the Conservation Commission, so those are necessary. Uh, if a special permit is required to build the project by the town, then that is necessary. Um, however, for instance, uh, a building permit would be considered a ministerial permit, so that is not required at the initial application. Um, same goes for site plan review. If solar is allowed as of right with just with site plan review, um, we consider that to be ministerial in nature and not required at the initial application. Once the project is submitted um, through the application portal, if there are deficiencies, if there are administrative errors, then we do allow for a 10-day cure period. So once the project is initially reviewed by the clear result team, if they find issues, they will send the application back to the applicant telling them what needs to be fixed. And at that point in time, that's when the 10-day cure period begins. So the applicant has 10 days to fix whatever issues clear result points out. Um, the cure period is intended to correct errors. Um, so we just want to clarify, it's not intended to provide extra time to procure required documentation. So if documentation is missing and clear result returns the application back to the applicant, and that document is then provided, but it's clearly dated after the date of the initial submission, then that would be an ineligible application. Uh, clear result will also be looking at adder eligibility. So you can select adders when you are submitting the application through the Statement of Qualification Portal. Um, we do have some required documentation for some adders at preliminary application. So we require uh, letters from DOER, for instance, for the ag systems, for brownfield. Um, so if you're building on a landfill, obviously the post-closure use permit would be one of the required non-ministerial permits. So that are things, those are things for adder eligibility that Clear Result will be reviewing. However, if you are otherwise eligible, then being ineligible for an adder won't disqualify eligibility for the base compensation rate. So after the project has received its preliminary statement of qualification, it's granted the 12-month reservation period uh, to build the project, essentially, uh, the project can submit a claim. So by the reservation period deadline, uh, the initial 12-month deadline, the applicant must either file a claim demonstrating the project has been authorized to interconnect or file for one of the reservation period extensions. So we have four different extension types. An applicant can pay for a six month extension for a fee of $25 per kilowatt AC. And this fee is refundable if the project is completed and built. We also allow for a six month extension for a legal challenge to an issued permit. So to clarify, this is if a permit has been issued, the applicant provided that permit and um, you know, had an eligible system for the initial SQA, but there is an outside third-party challenger to that permit. We do grant up to a six-month extension. We allow for an indefinite extension if the applicant demonstrates that the facility is mechanically complete. So we, we need demonstration that uh, the project is mechanically complete with a signed certificate of completion, which is essentially a document stating that the project has passed its wiring inspection. We will also allow for case-by-case -case good cause extensions, but we're only going to consider a request for a good cause extension after a facility has already applied for the initial six-month extension for the fee. So after 18 months, if the project is still not mechanically complete and the applicant has a case to make for a good cause extension, we will consider it at that time. So once the project has been issued its authorization to connect, uh, the claim is submitted. At that point, the applicant should update 
system information with final as-built system specs, um, and also submit any required information for final adder eligibility, such as um, payment credit transfer forms, customer disclosure forms for community solar, et cetera. Clear result reviews the claim, recommends the DOER, the final SQB issued, the SQ is issued, and at that point is enrolled in the company's tariff. So this is a snapshot from yesterday um, from Clear Results Power Clerk website. So if you go onto the masmartsolar.com website, you'll see links for three different application portals. So there's an application portal for Eversource, an application portal for National Grid, and one for Unitil. So this is updated daily based on up-to-date application information. So it's probably a little bit higher because now it's another day past. But as you can see, for large systems, we are full in Eversource West, we are full in Unitil, and we're on Block 7 in National Grid. For small systems, we're still in Block 1 across the state. So small systems are coming in as we kind of as we expected at a steady pace of application. So for National Grid, if you are interested in national, building a National Grid, then I don't know if you have an ISA yet, but you want to try to get that as soon as possible to get the application in. Um, and then we have a lot of space in Eversource East. So for those of you who are in the Eversource East service territory, we're still on block one for large systems as well as small systems. So uh, we're, I think we're really going to try to see how we can encourage development um, in that part of the state, particularly because that's also where um, the majority of load is. Um, so it's, we're seeing it fill up, obviously, in the parts of the state with a lot of land. Um, but we still have a lot of space in Eversource East. So as of yesterday, we had 643 megawatts of applications submitted. So what are the next steps? As I mentioned, in the coming weeks, we will be announcing the outer tranche sizes for the remaining tranches. And we will also conduct a review of the program when 400 megawatts of preliminary SQs have been issued. So at this point in time, we have received over 2,500 applications, 643 megawatts. So Clear Result is going through all the applications. You know, we're working with them. I imagine it'll take to the end of the month, to the end of this month, really, for the first SQs to actually be issued. So the 400 megawatt review, even though we're already starting to look at the data and kind of brainstorm, we won't do an official process until we hit that 400 megawatt mark of SQs, not just app applications submitted. So that'll likely happen early 2019. Um, and as a result of that review, we may amend the smart regulation and or guidelines. So as I mentioned, you know, while we've obviously seen a, a lot of interest, we have a lot of applications before us, um, you know, the project, the program is it appears to be full in certain certain categories in certain parts of the state, but we just we have to kind of look at it and determine what our next steps are going to be in terms of program design. So for those of you online who are in municipal light districts, we also have a program that we will be launching in the coming weeks, uh, specifically aimed at customers located in municipal light districts since they are ineligible for the SMART program. So for over a year, DOER has been working with and collaborating with representatives from MLPs to develop this incentive program. The program will mainly be available to small systems. So we're looking at the residential sector because that covers about 95% of the projects we see in MLPs. So it'll be a rebate-based program for facilities less than or equal to 25 kW DC. Um, so it's going to be structured similarly to the Commonwealth Solar Rebate Program. So the rebate available will actually be, it'll be there'll be cost share of 50-50 between DOER and the participating MLP. 
So under this program, uh, again, they'll generate class one recs, but since the MLP is participating in granting this rebate, the class one recs created from eligible systems will be transferred to the MLP um, that they are located in. So we did issue a program opportunity notice. Um, we will announce the results shortly. Uh, we're just kind of working through the final details of that. So one last uh, poll question, just because we're trying to see what interest lies out there for battery storage. Um, whether or not, for those of you that are looking at projects, uh, that project may also have a battery attached to it. And we're just going to give people a few seconds to vote here before we close it out. Okay, it looks like we're closing it out. And there you go. Okay. Oh, great. So I encourage you to you know carefully look at the guidelines we have on our energy storage adder. Um, but also in this space, uh, you know, pay attention to other things VOER will be doing in the coming months because we are going to be uh, releasing our proposal for the Clean Peak standard, um, which was a new um, portfolio standard created and passed by the legislature last summer. So DOER is going to be looking at that program as well, which will be looking at uh, many types of systems, but battery storage will be one of the main factors of the Clean Peak standard. So our last slide just has a number of links to um, resources on our website, on the masmartsolar.com website, which is run by Clear Result. We have a number of FAQs on the masmartsolar.com website, as well as uh, document requirements. Um, you can see the tariff uh, in the file room at the DPU. Just enter in 17140. And if you have any questions, please email at doer.smart and maps.gov or clearresults at ma.smart at clearresults.com. Um, so a couple questions. So we have a question about national grid service territories. So they they have they haven't officially reached block seven because we have yet to qualify all of the projects and applications that we've received. But we've received enough applications to reach block seven. So uh, if, for instance, in a, a new application is submitted today they will be effectively applying for Block 7. Um, there was a question about what will a sample SMART bill look like. So we do have, there's a sample SMART bill for National Grid. If you look on our website, um, there are slides put up there that were created by the utility companies. So the majority of them have to do with uh, one-line diagrams for how to install meters on sites, but National Grid also has a sample smart bill, um, so you can see what that will look like. There's a question about details of the application. So if you look on our website right now, we actually have a list of all of the applications that we received in block one. Um, so if you look at the DOER website on the SMART page, um, so that list does not represent the queue. So we haven't ordered them in any way. It's just simply the details of the project applications that we've received. So you can see uh, which projects have been submitted, um, which adders are 
being sought for the different types of projects. So all of that is listed on our website. Yeah. Yeah, and just a reminder that uh, the slides will be posted um, and they will be available on DOER's website. So projects that, once an application is submitted to the website from Clear Result, there's a question about a process. So you'll receive a confirmation email from Clear Result that the application has been received. And um, once your application goes through review and has been approved, you'll also receive notices at every step of the way. And they have a particular uh, status updates about what point in the review process your, your application has been. And we have a number of other questions, and we'll just simply uh, review them and answer them, and they'll be posted on the Green Communities website as well. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's a little bit after 12. Uh, thank you all for hanging in there, uh, and thank you, Caitlin, for um, providing all that information. Um, and uh, we will go ahead and, uh, as Caitlin said, post the questions and answers. Um, with, with the webinar. Um, so uh, thank you and um, have a great Friday.